Good day. My name is Hades Renzo Gopalmares from TIPH, and I will be talking about renal vascular disease. So here are the topics that we will be discussing. So first, we're going to talk what is renal vascular disease. After that, the disease is under renal vascular disease. We have acute occlusion of a renal artery, renal vein thrombosis, renal artery stenosis, and ischemic neuropathy, and nef nepro nephropathy, steroderma, and thrombotic microangiopathies. So now we will talk about what is renal vascular disease. So renal vascular disease or renal vascular diseases are diseases that involve the narrowing of the artery to one or both kidneys. So th these diseases often result to high blood pressure and kidney complications. So RVD is often overlooked because of the high blood pressure. So um, the diagnosis would usually be high blood pressure instead of um, renal vas a renal vascular disease. So here is the classification of renal vascular diseases according to an anatomic location of vasculopathy. So we have three main loca anatomic locations, the renal arteries, the renal arterioles and microvasculature, and the renal veins. So for the renal arteries, you have two, the acute occlusion of renal artery and renal artery stenosis and ischemic nephro ne nephropathy. For renal arterioles and microvasculature, we have scleroderma and thrombotic microangiopathies. And lastly, for the renal veins, the renal vein thrombosis. Now we move on to acute occlusion of renal artery. So basically, acute occlusion of renal artery is what it means. It's an occlusion of the renal artery. So these, this can occur due to two main reasons. The first is thrombosis of renal arteries, and second is atheroembolism. First, we'll talk, we will talk about thrombosis of renal arteries. So in thrombosis renal arteries, large renal infarcts causes pain, vomiting, nausea, hypertension, fever, elevated lactate dehydrogenase, and aspartate aminotransferase, hematuria, and proteinuria. Uh, renal arteriography is usually the one responsible for establishing the diagnosis of this disease. Uh, also, in addition, with the occlusions of large arteries, surgery may, re may be required um, when it comes to occlusions of smaller arteries, anticoagulants should be used for the occlusions. Occlusion of one or both of the renal arteries can also rarely occur in patients treated with ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. And the second reason, renal atheroembolism, it now this usually arises when uh, during aortic or coronary coronary angiography or surgery causes cholesterol embolization of small renal vessels in a patient with diffuse atherosclerosis. Uh, it can also be spontaneous or associated with thrombolysis and rarely may occur after the initiation of an anticoagulant such as warfarin. Renal insufficiency may also develop suddenly a uh, few weeks or days after a procedure. Some systemic symptoms may also occur, such as fever, myalgias, headache, and weight loss. Peripheral eosinophilia, eosinophiluria, and hypocomplementemia may also be observed. And the diagnosis of renal atheroembolism is, can be made through patient history, clinical findings, and renal biopsy. Now, renal, renal biopsy is usually successful in detecting cholesterol emboli in the renal microvasculature. And these are seen as needle-shaped clefts. So according that uh, there is no specific therapy for renal atheroembolism, and patients have a poor overall prognosis due to the associated burden of atherosclerotic vascular disease. However, there is an improvement, a partial improvement in renal function several months after onset of the renal impairment.
Next, we have renal vein thrombosis. So what is renal vein thrombosis? Uh, renal th vein thrombosis is a thrombotic occlusion of one or both of the main renal veins, which can result to an acute kidney injury or a ch chronic kidney disease. So what are the probable causes of RVT? So RVT occurs in a variety of settings. This includes when you oral con in on your oral contraceptive use, trauma, uh, nephrotic syndrome, extrinsic compression of the renal vein, and invasion of the renal vein by renal cell carcinoma. This can also happen uh, in dehydration, specifically in infants. Yes. So the diagnosis of renal vein thrombosis is through selective renal renography. It's a definitive diagnosis. So some clinical manifestations of renal vein thrombosis are nausea and vomiting, leukocytosis, and of course, compromised renal functions. So how do we treat or what's a medical therapy for renal vein, vein thrombosis? So therapy with thrombolytics may be effective. And use of oral anticoagulants, such as warfarin, are usually prescribed for a uh, longer-term therapy. So that's it for renal vein thrombosis. We now move on to renal stenosis and ischemic nephropathy. So renal artery stenosis is a narrowing of one or more arteries that carry blood to your kidneys. So the nar when the narrowing of these arteries prevent normal amounts of oxygen-rich blood from reaching our kidneys or our kidneys. Now, ischemic nephropathy describes a loss of renal function or renal parenchyma cells due to stenosis or occlusion of the renal artery or its branches. So basically, ischemic nephropathy is a result of renal artery stenosis. So RAS or renal artery stenosis is the main cause of renovascular hypertension. Now, this could be due to atherosclerosis or fibromuscular dysplasia. Atherosclerosis um, uh, is consistent of uh, two-thirds of the cases, and usually with men age 60 years above. And for fibromuscular dysplasia, it constitutes one-third of the cases, and usually white women age less than 45 years old. Um, renal hyperfibromuscular Hypoperfusion due to renal artery stenosis activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis or the RAS, which you know are. You know. So, here are the clinical findings associated with renal artery stenosis. So, hypertension, abrupt onset of, of hypertension before the age of 50, which is suggestive of fibromuscular dysplasia, at or after the age of 50 years suggestive of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Also, a, uh, a manifestation could be accelerated or malignant hypertension, which is associated with polydipsia and hyponatremia. Uh, lastly, uh, refractory hypertension as well. So, uh, renal abnormalities, unexplained azotemia, which uh, it is, it suggests atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Um, unilateral small kidney and unexplained hypokalemia. Other findings would be severe retinopathy, uh, peripheral vascular disease, and unexplained congestive heart failure or acute pulmonary edema. So the gold standard in diagnosis of renal artery stenosis is conventional arteriography. Magnetic resonance angiography has also been used in many health centers, uh, uh, also duplex ultrasonography. However, that is an, an alternative. On, it is only to be used if experienced operators are available. In patients with normal renal function and hypertension, the captopril or enaliprat renogram may be used as, as for a screening test. So also have the therapy for the hypertension, which comes with renal artery stenosis. So we can use nitroprusside, labetol, or, or calcium antagonists. These are generally effective in lowering blood pressure acutely. 
Now, for long-term treatment for the hypertension, we have ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II receptor blockers, since these are the inhibitors of the RAS axis. Uh, also included is non-pharmacologic management of lifestyle modification and risk factor in dyslipidemia management. And so an intervention such as revascularization should be considered if the reduction in GFR, if, it, if there is a progressive and unexplained reduction in glomerular filtration during treatment of systemic hypertension, if there's poorly controlled hypertension, rapid or recurrent decline in glomerular filtration rate, and recurrent episodes of acute, unexplained pulmonary edema. So the choice of non-medical management options depends on four things. We have the type of lesion, whether this is atherosclerotic or fibromuscular, the location of the lesion, osteal versus non-osteal, the localized surgical and or inter interventional expertise, and the presence of other localized comorbidities such as an aortic aneurysm or severe aortiliac, aortoiliac disease. Notably, the patient should be evaluated frequently, and this would be every three to six months. Here we have the management of patients with renal artery stenosis and or ischemic nephropathy. So, right, you have hypertension and, and or uh, reduced numerical filtration rate. But first, we initiate therapy, antihypertensive medication, such as um, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs, or angiotensin to receptor blockers. We have lifestyle risk factor and dyslipidemia management. So, and then we sus the suspicion of renovascular disease. Either you have low suspicion or high suspicion. Low suspicion, we check for stable renal function and we check for blood pressure. If they're excellent, uh, we then we optimize antihypertensive and medical therapy. Then we repeat the assessment three to six months after three to six months and check if there's significant disease progression. If it's stable, again, st check for stable renal function and blood pressure. And then again, optimize antihypertensive therapy. Now, if it's a high suspicion, we do non invasive imaging at, uh, to check if there is renal artery stenosis present. We check if the comorbidity disease risk, indications for revascularization, regulatory congestion, deteriorating kidney function, ACE inhibitor, advanced renal failure, bilateral high grade RAS, or solitary functioning kidney, uncontrolled hypertension. If it's low, uh, proceed to the cellular function, optimize antihypertensive, repeat assessment to six months until optimize antihypertensive therapy. If it's moderate, uh, directly to the repeat assessment, three to six months, significant expression until optimized antihypertensive and medical therapy. If it's high, the prescription failure. We uh, need renal intervention. We need a PTRA or the percutaneous transluminal region, renal angioplasty or, or stent. We also need a surgical revascularization and nephro nephrectomy, non surgical your kidney. So you may need to repeat procedure to recheck for vessel patency or stenosis, technical failure, de novo, contrast lesions, a embolia, which will again also lead to optimizing antihypertensive medical therapy. Now also after renal intervention, we repeat assessment six to 12 weeks, check if there's excellent blood pressure control or stable renal function. If no, go to recheck for vessel patency Patency, stenosis, technical failure, de novo contralateral lesions, other but if yes, directly to optimize antihypertensive and medical therapy. Now, from the repeat assessment, three to six months in, if there's a progression, um, go to renal intervention, the PTRA stand, surgical vascularization, and when the last stable renal function or excellent pressure, if there's no stable renal function and no excellent blood pressure, directly to renal intervention. Okay, so for the fifth disease that we will be talking about, we have scleroderma. So what is scleroderma? So 
It is basically an autoimmune disease wherein it attacks the connective tissue under the skin and around internal organs and blood vessels, which will inevitably cause scarring and thickening of the tissue in those areas. The scleroderma, they commonly affect the kidney. Um, statistically, 52% of patients with scleroderma um, have renal involvement. So we have this thing called scleroderma renal crisis. Um, now this renal crisis can cause sudden oliguric renal failure, microangiopathic, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and severe hypertension. This is due to small vessel occlusion. So for the treatment of scleroderma or scleroderma, scleroderma renal crisis, uh, we need aggressive control of blood pressure with ACE inhibitors and dialysis. This is to improve survival and to restore renal function. Okay, so the last disease we'll be talking about are some thrombotic microangiopathies. So thrombotic microangiopathies can actually be subdivided into two general syndromes or two groups. This is thromb thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or TTP, and hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. So in both, these in both of these conditions, what's similar is that both have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, with anemia, RBCs, fragmentation, schistocytes, thrombocytopenia, and neurologic signs and symptoms. Also, there's a presence of AKI or acute kidney illness. So let's differentiate thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and hemolytic uremic syndrome. So in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, um, patients who have this suffer from microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, fever, thrombocytopenia, neurologic symptoms and signs, and renal dysfunction. On the contrary, in hemolytic uremic syndrome, the extrarenal symptoms in HUS is less prominent or less common. And this is actually the most common cause of acute kidney illness in children, constituting 90%. So here we have a table of the major causes of thrombotic microangiopathy. So if you take a look, um, we have genetic, idiopathic, infectious regulated and autoimmune and miscellaneous. So for, in, for genetic, for, the, for TTP, we have the deficiency of ADMTS13 or VWF protease. And for HUS, you have deficiency of a complement regular proteins, factor H, complement factor one, factor B, factor H related protein one. Uh, okay. And then for idiopathic, for TTP, acquired antibodies to ADAMTS13 and HUS acquired antibodies to the complements. Uh, also could be infectious from bacteria, Escherichia coli, Shigella, Salmonella, Camillobacter, etc. from viral infections also, such as HIV, Cytomegalo, Epstein-Barr virus. Also drug-related, um, calcineurin inhibitors, such as acrolimus and cyclosporin, antiplatelet agents, diclopidine, clopidogrel, Quinine for drugs used for chemotherapy, mitomycin C, gemcitabine, and cisplatin. Okay, T3 monoclonal antibodies. Angiogenesis or VEGF inhibitors such as bevacizumab, sonitib, and serafinib. Also, autoimmune disorders such as antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. We have systemic lupus erythematosus vas and vasculitis. Other Causes could be post bone marrow transplantation, disseminated malignancy, and lastly, pregnancy. So now we move on to the laboratory evaluation. So, the laboratory ev evaluation, we will usually reveal an evidence of a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, although this may be absent in certain cases or causes, such as in antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Also, the reticular, site crown town, the reticular site town should be elevated along with an increase in red blood cell distribution width. Now, hemolysis would also increase the LDH and decrease circulating haptoglobin. 
with a negative Coombs test. Now, examination of the peripheral smear is key. is because the presence of schistocytes will help establish the diagnosis. Thus, we have the treatment of thrombotic microangiopathies. For thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, we have plasmapheresis, or the removal of antibodies through plasma exchange, and infusion of fresh frozen plasma. And also in patients with atypical HUS, um, we have a therapy with a monoclonal antibody such as ecolizumab. Um, this is anti a monoclonal antibody to C5 that prevents the production of the terminal complement component C5A in the membrane attack complex C5B-9. Aside from the diseases mentioned before, there are also other diseases related to renovascular disease. We have vasculitis, sickle cell nephropathy, arteriolar nephrosclerosis, and that's it. Uh, thank you for listening to the report. Uh, here are my references.